Okay, so it's been said before, it bears, uh, I think, repeating here though. Sierra Madre Games makes some of the most opaque, dense, and difficult to understand games in the board gaming hobby. Mixed in with all the rules uh, tends to be a lot of historical flavor and thematic elements. And that's great, that's actually something that makes uh, their games incredibly intriguing and attractive to, to someone like me. But learning a new Sierra Madre game is almost a game in and of itself. Which is a little unfortunate because beneath all that difficulty tends to be, in many cases, uh, a game that is relatively simple mechanically. They're not, it's not to say the games aren't deep and complex, they are in many cases, but it can be easy to keep all the rules in your head once they're there. Unfortunately, getting them there in the first place is, is often very hard, and Pax Renaissance is no exception to that. If you are watching this, I'm going to assume you know, generally speaking, what Pax Renaissance is. So I'm not going to give any kind of overview or explanation of the game, um, you know, what, what, what it's about. Why don't we jump right into setup though, and we can kick this thing off. Let's go. So the first thing we have to do is lay out these 10 map cards. Uh, there are two sides to each card. The, the starting side is the medieval side, so that's face up, and the other side is a the theological side. Uh, there are two exceptions uh, to this rule, and I'll talk about those in just a little bit. But for the time being, let's go ahead and set these up. Got England, then France, then the HRE, it's the Holy Roman Empire. Then we have Hungary, and finally Byzantium. These are all medieval side up. And then below that, we have Portugal and Aragon, and then the Papal States, which is one of those two exceptions I mentioned, followed by the Ottoman Empire, and then the Mamluks. So uh, the Papal States it has two theological sides. It's got Christianity on the starting side, and then Islam on the reverse. Uh, start again, though, on Christianity. It's the reverse, though, for the Mamluks. They have the Islamic side uh, as their starting side, and then the reverse is Christianity. So as the game goes on, through holy wars and some other stuff, you can flip those cards around, uh, but they will always be a theology, uh, never medieval. Alright, so the next thing we need to do is place starting units. Every card has uh, cities printed on it. There's a text with a unit next to it. At game start, we will only have to worry about capital cities, which you can tell uh, are capitals because they are printed in all caps, like Valencia here in Aragon. The way you determine what's going to go there is the unit printed. So here you're going to get a Christian knight on Valencia, and uh, then you're good to go. In Algiers and Timbuktu, you don't place any units. Timbuktu does have a funny symbol here, and that's for blocking trade routes. Uh, at the start of the game, a couple of these are going to be covered up by these black or white circles. Uh, Timbuktu is one, there's the Spice Islands, and then up top there's another place in the Holy Roman Empire. Alright, so the map is all set up here, it's all laid out, and the next thing we need to do is place these Empire cards somewhere where you can reach them. I like to put them all uh, on the left side of the map, just because I think it looks nice and it's easy to, uh, easy to see kind of what is available and what isn't. So I'm going to lay them out here in the exact same ordering as the uh, map cards. So I've got the Mamluks, the Ottomans, the Papal States, uh, Aragon, uh, and Portugal on the bottom, and then up top I'm placing Byzantium, Hungary, the HRE, France, and here we finally have England. Uh, once those are all there, uh, I like to kind of line them up, make sure that it's easy to see uh, what's available and what isn't, and it's just for bookkeeping. Next we get uh, the victory condition cards. I'm going to put these opposite of the empire cards to the right of the map. And again, uh, make sure the inactive side is up, and this is just to make sure it's all easily uh, identifiable as the game goes on, which is uh, very important in a game like this. And uh, yeah, just line them up, doesn't matter the order they go in. Uh, next, we're going to be placing these units. Now, in the beginning, you only need Islamic and Christian units, because no reformists start on the map. So uh, let's get those down, and yeah. Uh, so I, I've said this before, I love setting up games. Uh, there's something kind of uh, relaxing and like zen-like when you're placing stuff down on a map and getting it all arranged right. So I always like to take the time and uh, do this before game night uh, starts. I think it's convenient for everyone and it's an activity I enjoy. I think it's a good time. Alright, so next I have to take these comets and set them aside so I can set up the market decks. Uh, there are two for each deck, two for the east, two for the west. 
and I'll just put them aside for a moment while I set up this east deck, which uh, they have black backs, and so I have sleeved my cards for these with uh, black sleeves. As you can see, they, they match pretty closely. I've got some text, but it's all the same, and you, you can remember what it says. So I'm going to sleeve these up, and then I'm going to count out 12 cards. Uh, and again, I'm not going to do this on camera for the other deck, because you do the exact same thing. Uh, you count out 12 cards, and then go and fetch those comets, and take the two eastern comets in this case, and uh, stick them on top of the 12 cards you just counted out. So put them on top, and then shuffle them real good. Make sure they are uh, they are separated and randomized within those. Now, now it's a 14 uh, card stack. So shuffle them up real good, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Uh, something that I like about sleeves is you just kind of mash them into each other and it's real smooth, real good, and it randomizes it super well. Uh, it's very easy. So set that 14 uh, stack aside and pick up the other cards that you have. We're going to do four for each player. I'm setting up for a three player game. So that will be 12 cards I'm going to count out. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So take the rest of the cards and toss them. Uh, they're not going to be used in this game. So those 12 cards I just counted out are going to be stuck on top of the 14 cards that include the comet. Uh, you're not going to shuffle these anymore. That will screw up the seating. And uh, now we're ready to do the other deck and continue. Okay, so I've got all of the East and West market cards laid out. And the next thing to do is flip over the final, the far left card in each market to be face down. This will be for a performing trade fair action. If you look at the back of one of these cards, uh, this one will say, uh, say East Trade Route up top, and the West says West Trade Route, uh, as you could expect. There's some text on the bottom too. They're the same, uh, so as long as you know what the action is, you don't really need to see this text. Uh, but the, that card is face down, it cannot be bought from the market. All right, so the last thing to do for setup is to give each player their starting Florins. The first player here, the Fugger Bank, gets three. Uh, the next player to his left will get four Florins. Uh, the player to their left gets five, and in a four-player game, that last person gets six. Cool, so our game here is all set up, and we are ready to begin playing. Now, we're gonna do this two actions at a time, because, well, on your turn, a player must take two actions, so that makes sense. There's also a pool of six different actions that you're able to pick from on your turn, and so uh, two and six kind of divide into each other just fine. So why don't we go ahead and start playing? Okay, you know, so before we continue on, I do want to make a note here, uh, kind of about the structure of this rule video. This is not meant to be a comprehensive replacement of the living rules or included rulebook for Pax Renaissance. This is meant to sort of work in conjunction with those. Uh, for me, the hard part about this game was learning how everything kind of comes together, not the specifics of each piece. I think the rules actually do a pretty good job of explaining uh, how each thing functions. The hard part is knowing uh, what you should be looking for, and the rules don't do a good job of that. So um, at the end of this video, I will have some kind of like a little sidebar about things that are difficult, uh, that were difficult for me to understand when I started to play. Some rules do have little gotchas in them, and I'm hoping that I'll explain a bunch of those uh, at the end. But in the meantime, um, again, this is not meant to replace the rule book. This is meant to work in conjunction with it. So anyway, I just wanted to note that. Why don't we continue on? All right, so we are gonna go over these actions one at a time, and we're gonna start with purchasing cards from the market. Now you can purchase from the Eastern or Western markets, and the available cards for purchase are gonna be these five face-up ones uh, in each market. The Let's say this player wanted to purchase this Duke of Athens card. It would cost him two florins to do that. Uh, and that's because it is the second card uh, in, in the row left to right. The first one costs one, then two, and then so on up to five florins for that last card. Now to perform this action, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the amount of money you need, in this case for Duke of Athens, you need two, and you're gonna place one florin on every card before it in the row, including the trade fair card. And then you take the Duke of Athens into your hand. All right, so now I have a second action on my turn. So let's say I wanted to play the Duke of Athens. All I would do is place him in either the east or west tableau next to my banker card. 
Now the card will dictate which one I have to do. As you can see on the bottom here, this one says East with that little arrow on the bottom. So I would take the Duke of Athens and just put him to the right side of my banker card. So as I put a card into my tableau, I have a couple of options to consider that must be decided now and not later. Now, the options I have revolve around the units on this banner in the upper left of a card. Uh, all cards have these units and this banner, and they get placed in the location on the bottom of the card. So for the Duke of Athens, I would place one reformist rook in the Ottoman Empire. Now, it has to go into a city, but it does not have to match the, the unit printed on the city. Uh, that's only for levies, which I'll explain later. Alright, so the second thing I'm going to point out is the first thing you need to make a choice on, and that's the one-shot. Now, not every card in the game has a one-shot on it. Uh, if it does, it has a bomb and then a piece of text next to it. In this case, it's the conspiracy ability. If you do opt to do the one-shot, you must place every unit printed on this card into the map. Now, if you decide you do not want to do the one-shot, that's fine. Uh, you may still place some or all of the units into the map. So just to be clear, uh, when I place this unit, if I decide to, I could put it in Modan or in Rhodes, in this example with the Duke of Athens. Even though Modan happens to have the same printed unit as the one I'm placing, it doesn't have to go there. Okay, so that's two actions for the first player, and once they clean up the market, their turn will be over and we will move on clockwise from them, so let's keep going. Okay, so at the end of your turn, you gotta clean up the market by sliding cards down the row and then flipping over new ones to fill in the last open slots. Alright, so hey, look at that. We jumped ahead a few turns. Uh, some of the Empire cards have been purchased, the map looks a little different, maybe things have been flipped over. That's because the next few actions require the game to have progressed a bit to make sense. Alright, so now let's talk about East or West Tableau Ops. Uh, like I said, you can do east or west, uh, but only one per turn. So we're going to do the western for this player, he's got a few more cards here. And what we do is you may perform one action on each of your cards in that, uh, that side of your tableau. So here this player could do, let's say, Inquisitor on Cromwell or Tax, but not both. And they'd have to also make a choice on this card over here. And you don't have to do an action on every card if you don't want. And you also don't have to do them in any particular order. So up next, we will talk about the trade fair action. Uh, you use these face down cards in the east or west markets to do those actions. You, uh, you take the money that is on the card that has been put on from purchasing cards, and in a three player game you'll put two more on it. Then the person enacting the action takes one of those florins. So next, we need to look over at the map and follow the black or white lines to the end of that trail, depending on if we're doing the west or east trade fair. Now, these black or white discs play into the trade fairs. Uh, they will note where the trade fair starts, or rather where it doesn't start. You see, at the beginning of the game, Tana and Trebizond are the starting points for the east and west trade fairs, as noted by these starbursts. If they are uncovered, then that is where the trade fair begins. So at the start of the game, Tana is the port through which the eastern trade fair starts, and it goes down through Hungary, the Ottomans, and finally ending at this little black arrow in Mamluk. Now, every uh, card that the trade route passes through will get a levy, and a levy is uh, a unit matching the printed unit on this map card. Now, in this specific example that I have set up, Byzantium and Hungary are both what you'd call saturated. That means that none of the cities are free of units. If you look down at the Ottoman Empire though, you'll see here that there is an open spot in Rhodes. Okay, so let's do this Eastern Trade Fair. Starting in Byzantium, we do not place units because it's saturated. Crossing over from Byzantium to Hungary, we also don't place units there because of saturation, but when we cross from Hungary to the Ottomans, this green cube gives that player one florin, taken from the trade fair card that's face down. Now, the Ottomans, like I said before, can get a levy, and so the player doing the trade fair places a levy. In this example, it would be a, a unit in Rhodes. Crossing from the Ottomans to Mamluk will give the blue player a florin, just like the green player got before, taken from the trade fair card. Now, they'll take that florin and put it in their personal bank. Mamluk finally is where the trade fair ends, and it is saturated, so it gets no levies. 
If we wanted to do a Western trade fair, it is the exact same process, uh, except we start in Trebizond at the beginning of the game and move around following the white line all the way to the Holy Roman Empire. You give one florin to every concession you cross at a border, and a levy is placed on every card that can take it. Now, if, while you're doing a trade fair, the final florin is removed from the trade fair card, the fair immediately ends, no more money is given to concessions, and no more levies are placed. Finally, at the end of your turn, you will discard the trade fair card from the game and flip over the next closest card in that market to become the new trade fair card. Okay, so we've got two actions left to go over, and they are both super straightforward. The first one is selling cards. You may sell any card in your hand or tableau, and for it, you get two florins taken from the bank. The other one is claiming victory. To use that victory action, you must be able to satisfy the requirements of one of the four activated victory cards, the keyword being activated. Remember, they all start inactive. In order to turn one of those cards active, well, you know, why don't I show you right now? All right, so let's say there's a comet available in one of the markets. This one would cost four florins, so you pay that money just like normal to the cards before it in the line, and then instead of taking it into your hand, you just discard it from the game. Now, when you do that, you immediately pick one inactive victory card and you flip it over to the activated side. If we take a look here in detail, you can see every card on the back says inactive at the start, and it's got a bit of information about that card. On the other side is the activated side, which includes the win conditions. Here for Renaissance, it says you need more republics and two more law than any of your opponents. If you have that, go ahead and take the victory action and win the game. All right, so that's PAX Renaissance. Uh, that's not too bad, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward, mechanically speaking. You just kind of go around and around, buying cards, playing cards. Eventually a comet is going to come up in the market, someone will buy it probably, and then victory becomes possible for all the players. Uh, there are, however, a few nitpicky, maybe confusing bits that certainly screwed me up on my first, second, or even fifth time playing. Uh, so hopefully we can go over a few of them right now, and they won't get you as bad as they got me. So why don't we start with the tax action, and we'll go from there. Okay, so with tax, remember that you are targeting a concession, which could be your own, and it must be bordering an unsaturated map card. So if we look at this example here, the Holy Roman Empire and France could both be taxed uh, because there are other players' concessions and levies able to be placed in those cities. England, on the other hand, could not because it is saturated. Remember, the player getting taxed places the levy. All right, let's talk next about Repress. Now, Repress gains the player using it one florin, but they are limited to the type of unit they can Repress. If we look at this card on the bottom here, we'll see that he has a knight icon on the Repress action itself. That means he can only Repress knights. This card, on the other hand, Isabella of Castile, can Repress rooks and pawns, but not knights. All right, Campaign is an action only available on the King side of Empire cards. And two things to keep in mind are that you must pay all potential attacking knights, and no knights move as a result of the action. So if England wanted to campaign into Portugal, you must pay one florin to each of these knights, so that makes for a total of two, and nothing moves, so a newly conquered Portugal would be empty. All right, let's take a look now at Vote. Voting is really powerful, it, it can take away Empire cards from other players. But the thing to remember is it only takes away Empire cards from other players. So you may not vote for cards that remain in the Empire stack. You can only use it to target cards players already have. So this isn't really a, uh, an ability, but something to keep in mind. If there's a bishop on your card, you can just sell that card and the bishop is discarded. Alright, and finally, I recommend this player aid. It's available on BoardGameGeek, and uh, I'll link to it in the description of this video. It is super useful. I printed up a couple of copies and laminated them to be able to be passed around while players are playing. Cool. So those are a few of the easy to overlook rules, uh, I feel anyway, in PAX Renaissance. Hopefully you will not overlook them now. 
and when you sit down to play this game for the first time or the fifth time, uh, it will be a much easier experience and an enjoyable one, because this game is very enjoyable uh, with the right crowd. I would recommend capping the game at three players and not four. Uh, four can really drag out a lot of things, and it, in my experience, three is the ideal player count, but one, two, and three are all very good. Uh, and yeah, you know, if you liked this video, if this helped you out, uh, I appreciate you watching all the way through. Go check out my website, phasingplayer.com. I, uh, I post videos like this there, and I also post things that I write there too, on video games and board games as well. So, good luck fighting pirates, uh, burning heretics, and maybe, if you're lucky, becoming the Pope. Have a good one.